Good morning, everybody. Paul here coming at you with another Crypto Coffee update where we talk about the news, conferences, events, essentially any information you would want to see as it pertains to the exciting digital financial technology realm that is colloquially known as crypto. And of course, I do have my coffee here to get us started right, because what's a rocket without fuel? And please join me for a simultaneous sip where we just take a sip of tea, water, or in my case, coffee together. Mm. Good stuff. All right. So let's jump into the meat of the matter, the important topics of the day, the first of which is our beloved website, Cryptide.cc, a short introductory video for uh, anybody who is just now joining us. Video section, we have all of the videos produced by Cryptide, including uh, the Crypto Coffee videos. Under the news section, it's all of the articles that we're going to be discussing here today that are breaking news, as well as any news that I peruse that I find particularly relevant to share with you all throughout the day. And we have the blog section, which contains primarily for the time being next week's crypto, which is an aggregate calendar of all of the conferences happening as it pertains to crypto all around the world, color-coded by region for your convenience and perhaps even occurring in your local area, so you can attend those if you so choose. Again, cryptide.cc, check us out. And now the meat of the matter, your feature presentation that you have been awaiting with bated breath, the articles. NEM Foundation on the Brink of Bankruptcy. Ooh, man, today's episode is full of some interesting tidbits, perhaps a bit somber, but nonetheless fantastic information that I think is... Um, bodes pretty well for the crypto space as a whole. After all, you can't grow a beautiful garden that bears fantastically delicious and nutritious fruit without using a bit of compost. And what is compost but the remains of projects that were once potentially successful, some that had voracious success that have evolved past their prime. Now, that's not necessarily the case here per se. The NEM Foundation is more of the front-facing entity that does a lot of the marketing and communications for the NEM project, helping to translate some of the development side that's going on currently. Now, the NEM Foundation has just recently seen a new president instated. Her name is Alex Tinsman, and she told Coindesk on Wednesday that the NEM Foundation is kind of limping along on both feet. 160 million tokens are currently being requested, which is worth about $7.5 million just to keep the foundation chugging along. Now, they are hoping to cut costs in a multitude of ways, uh, the not least painful of which is taking the 202-member team and sizing that down just, just a little bit by about 150 people. So, layoffs all around. Glad it's after Christmas, for sure. Uh, and this is definitely... Potentially, now we'll have to take a look here at Lon Wong's feet, an individual who is the previous NEM Foundation president, and it seems that some developers in the community don't necessarily uh, have a great opinion of this individual and how he conducted himself throughout last year. Now, 80 million tokens were spent last year between December 7, uh, 2017 and January 2019. And again, December 2017 and on the way down through 2018, we did see a descent into the bear market. However, keep in mind that at the beginning of this time frame, valuations were astronomical when compared to today. So even though it's half of the amount of tokens that is currently being asked, one has to speculate about the underlying USD value and the actualized marketing uh, investment that that could have led to. Interestingly enough, though, uh, they're reducing the marketing activities because what they've been doing is marketing a product known as Catapult, which isn't technically out yet. So this is a network upgrade to the NEM network slated to add a lot more additional functionality. However, if it's not out, there's only so much hype you can generate, especially with the relatively opaque release dates. Now, also, Lon Wong seems to have utilized his position as president a bit unscrupulously, according to one anonymous developer. Proxima X and a Ecobit are two projects and ICOs that were supported voraciously by the then-acting president, Lon Wong, of the NEM Foundation. The Proxima X tokens reportedly raised about $33 million in 2018, pretty good for a bear market, and the company's website lists Wong as the CEO. So definitely kind of left a bad taste in everybody's mouth that this individual already at the helm of a uh, very important institution as it relates to NEM would use his position to in turn self-enrich by jumping ship to another project. So that kind of adds a little bit of, uh, I guess, lemon to the cut for sure of financial potential financial insolvency on top of the individual who led you down that road, jumping ship and self-enriching. So really, best of luck to the NEM Foundation and of course, best of luck to the NEM Project. They do have a pretty big community in Japan, as is actually referenced in the article. Where are we at here? 
Anyways, yep, so really, unless you go to Japan, not too big of a community. So hopefully they can use that kind of um, geographic specific uh, community support to maybe pivot to a new implementation, maybe Japanese specific. I don't have any of the answers per se, but I definitely know that we're wishing them the best and not a good position to be in per se. Now, I said that this episode is chock full of some really interesting stuff, and we're going to get into a bit of a sensitive topic uh, that has a lot of implications that could potentially be drawn in either direction. So we're going to try and tackle this with a level of objectivity that we always try and maintain here at Cryptide, but with particular attention to detail today. So this individual, Trolly McTrollface, which is kind of hilarious name if you want to be taken seriously, says that Ripple's 200 plus institutional clients are claiming that it's a scam. Now, I think the title of this article is a bit of a bait and switch in terms of the title and what it implies and the information that is found therein. So let's take a look at some of these projects that Trolly McTroller face such a weird name, um, <laughs> uncovered for us. 2,100 retweets, 4,600 likes on a tweet by Ripple saying that yes, we have 200 customers worldwide, which is exciting for them. But all that glimmers is not necessarily gold, and that also doesn't necessarily mean that there ain't gold in them there hills. So it could be both, and both can be partially right. Both can't be totally right, but both of these camps can be partially right. And we'll see uh, We'll see what that means here momentarily. SendFriend is one of the partners for Ripple, and it seems as though this isn't actually a company per se. Maybe a shell company? Um, maybe they're still getting up and running? Again, no empirical evidence by which to base any claim one way or the other, but when this individual tried to sign up for SendFriend, it seems as though the waitlist is indeed as long as the amount of individuals who've signed up. So it doesn't seem that they're processing through uh, a lot of these requests quickly or at all. Again, another one, JNFX. It's just a postal address in London, even though they say, hey, yeah, we're a financial management company in the heart of London. So a financial management company that can't afford its own office, that's pretty humorous. Financial transaction control system also seems to be fake. Nobody uses them. Ali Bank of Kuwait, it's simply signed a memorandum, a memorandum of understanding, that's a tongue twister, uh, that doesn't have any legally binding implication per se. Same with TransPay Go, similar stuff going on there, and this is something that is occurring in a number of Ripple's alleged partners. Now, again, we'll be looking at some of the silver lining here, and this is not the case that every single partner does not exist. It's just some of the implications that are drawn from these partnerships that perhaps are either getting blown out of proportion, um, but definitely I wouldn't call it a scam as the author does in this article. Now, he followed up with another article with the Santander partnerships, and some of the uh, members of the community were insinuating, hey, you're really just kind of cherry picking partnerships here and focusing in on these companies that either are extremely young and still building out, or perhaps maybe failed, or maybe didn't even exist to begin with. However, there are legitimate nuggets of gold in this list. And so, uh, Trolly McTrollface, I'm never going to get used to calling him that, Trolly McTrollface, um, in a serious manner, I mean, uh, he did a deep dive of Santander to get an idea of the implications here. Now, Ripple and many of the cryptocurrency news outlets were putting out um, information about, hey, this is the first UK bank to use Ripple for cross-border payments, uh, 90 billion Santander bank partners with Ripple Labs, and this is kind of a case of, um, indeed, a partnership. So this is true. Um, this can indeed be true as well. However, some of the implications that subsequently kind of rifted off of this information were not true or perhaps extrapolated from some information um, that was implying things that weren't necessarily true, we'll take a look. Basically, more stunning is the fact that apparently Santander uses Ripple for half of all of its transactions. Um, this is Anna Boten, Santander Group's executive chairman, said that now 50% of the bank's annual international transfers could be covered with OnePay FX, which uses Ripple's X current. So could be covered. Uh, this is where the rubber meets the road here. This is a possibility. Essentially, this is a financial application, like just an app you can use on your phone, and is available for Spain, UK, Brazil, and Poland. These four countries account for 50% of the user base of the Banco Santander. So if every customer in these four countries began utilizing this mobile application for their cross-border payments, then indeed 50% of retail cross-border payments could be using X current, which is really cool. So there is the potentiality at play, certainly. However, the app itself only has 17 ratings, despite a 5 out of 5, so that's good, but only 17 ratings. So definitely not many people at all are using this service. However, this doesn't discredit the partnership itself. They have a working product, it's a potentiality, and that's not to say that, oh, well, give it a month and I'm sure 17 reviews will blossom into 17 million. 
probably not going to happen. But nonetheless, this is a fantastic uh, example of how information is conveyed in the crypto space, how extrapolations can so easily snowball out of control, and how sometimes individuals who may take up a position that a oh, Ripple is a scam because all of their partnerships are fake, ultimately may go about writing an article with a sense of bias that inadvertently proves that, yes, while there was extrapolations made from legitimate information that ultimately painted things as far more rosy than they were in actuality, it's not necessarily enough evidence and meritus of being called an out and out scam. Since a scam requires uh, intent, it requires basically shutting down shop, making out with the money uh, out the back door in a nefarious way, and that just doesn't seem to be the case as to what's going on here. Perhaps a bit of voracious and uh, maybe even um, overly um, excitable marketing tactics on the part of Ripple, but they're a company, and I wouldn't necessarily call that scammy behavior per se. So the silver lining we were talking about was Kuwait is launching NBK Direct Remit, which is a cross-border transaction app very similar to the one we just took a look at used by Santander that is also going to be utilizing RippleNet for an international payment network. And this is straight from the horse's mouth, the NBK. So just goes to show that while this may as well result in just a financial app that's developed uh, with the consent of the NBK uh, that's only used by a handful of people, nonetheless, they're building something, which I think in the end, at the end of the day, with all things considered, uh, absolutely, Ripple should perhaps focus on being more forthright with the reporting. Individuals who pick up this information should do a lot more of a deep dive to ensure that the validity of the information is indeed uh, ironclad, but stuff is being built, so that's pretty great. All right, so let's go ahead and move off of there. Again, going to be a bit more of a somber episode. Um, we're going to be talking about not only some of the more uh, nuanced implications, such as the Ripple partnerships that we've just examined, but we're also going to be examining how the uh, crypto bear market, and now what's being called the crypto winter, is affecting a lot of these entities. Liquid.io is the first big victim of insolvency problems, according to Dmitry Bodorin. Uh, he's the CEO of Hacken, a fantastic service that uh, it basically offers a tokenized incentive for transparency hackers, uh, which is seeking to make the blockchain space as transparent and forthright as possible. After all, the tools are available thanks to the technology. It's just about the individual interest and individual uh, work that needs to be put in to ensure that everything is above board and is as the owners say it is. So Liqui is the first exchange to suffer from basically having to close. See here, users, we were happy to announce a change in our policies, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, you'll be able to withdraw your digital assets through our website within 30 days after this message was sent. If you do not withdraw delisted digital assets since we announced changes to our policy, you also have another 30 days from the date this message is sent. Essentially, Liqui is shutting down completely. It does. We do not see any economic point in providing you with our services, which means that they're just not making enough money. And that has a lot of implications. There's a lot of reasons as to why uh, these exchanges are no longer making capital. Burn rates are huge. There's no more pump and dump revenues, no more listing fees, zero commissions. So let's go ahead and examine these um, kind of in short bursts one at a time. Pump and dump revenues. That is a huge, huge moneymaker for crypto projects. After all, if an individual group wants to unscrupulously pump a coin, they nonetheless have to execute transactions with a relatively rapid rate in order to pump the price upward. Each transaction that is executed on a respective exchange gives that exchange a transaction fee. After all, they are executing the transaction on the exchange. It's just an exchange fee, basically. So by executing these transactions, the exchange is getting a cut at every single turn. On the way up, and on the way down. So the more pump and dumps that exists, they actually benefit some of these more nefarious, less respectable exchanges as they profit with each one of these pump and dumps. No listing fees. We recall Expanse, a cryptocurrency project that was the first stable fork of Ethereum. Uh, they were um, they were in the news pretty heavily when they were approached by Binance to be listed on the Binance platform for a small, small fee of $250,000, roughly. So with smaller exchanges not having near the clout that Binance has, assumingly the listing fees have been going down, 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 as the crypto market has followed suit, going down, down, down in terms of prices. So that's less money in the crypto exchanges coffers to fund through the crypto winter. And zero commissions just goes to show that not that many people are joining the crypto space. Now, there's not that many commissions occurring. I'm assuming that means people who are referring each other to the exchanges, more user activity means, again, more trading fees. So this is kind of a triple, quadruple, octuple whammy from every side, showing that, indeed, exchanges are having an extremely hard time not only keeping up with demand, but also funding the proper security measures as volume decreases. 
and hackers stole another 180k from cryptopia so again just goes to show that these exchanges are not only not as safe as you may think on the surface uh, but also that they don't have the flexibility due to financial um financial preventative measures uh, what i'm trying to say basically they're having tight purse strings they don't have the capital needed to um, lead to flexibility to deal with these kind of situations after all are you going to are you going to prioritize day-to-day -day activities just trying to make ends meet and keep your head above water as a business or are you going to expand and go ahead and take out a loan to focus on security um, when you're not sure when the next bull market's going to kick off when you're not sure where you stand as an exchange relative to your competitors uh, when you have all of these variables that opaque uh, the hard line just bottom line of your finances it can be very difficult to make these decisions and it can lead to these kind of situations which is just just a shame. Another $180,000 of Ether was stolen, showing that the hacker has the private keys and would go ahead and withdraw funds from any Cryptopia wallet at will. Uh, Elementus also said that some wallets are still being topped up, suggesting that not all users are aware of this breach. So this just goes to show why getting information in the hands of people is so important. You have individuals using a compromised exchange. It's like walking into a bank that's actively being robbed at the back door and laying your hard-earned fiat cash on the counter and waving it goodbye, thinking it's heading to your deposit box when in all reality it's being chucked in a box that's being taken as well out the back door. So doing your own research is critical, but also ensuring that the institutions you're using to transfer these funds is uh, verified is equally critical. And here's an interesting, uh, an interesting, I guess, uh, example of kind of what I described with the pump and dump trading fees, adding a lot of benefit, not only to the exchanges, but also adding a perceived amount of depth to the order books. If you buy a Bitcoin for 3.5K, it's trading volume. Then you sell it, then you buy it again, then you sell it again. This is essentially wash trading. That This happens all the time on crypto exchanges. This is how pump and dumps work, essentially. They are fooling individuals into thinking that there is a depth of order book that isn't actually there. Um, oh, here's crypto medication. That's the guy that sent out the tweet. Um, he can be a bit of a hothead at times, but the stuff that he does, the research he does, is pretty great. I mean, got to give credit where credit is due. Um, but yeah, if we were all the same, that would be extremely boring. So I like his stuff, I got to say. So I wanted to give him a small shout out, especially for this tweet here. Just an interesting concept that helps to illustrate um, what I was trying to say and trying to convey with the pump and dumps and how that not only benefits exchanges, but also uh, benefits them in a secondary way um, through the virtue of making their order books seem as though they are more liquid than they actually are. And that could lead to a lot of traps for individuals who are trying to buy in at certain prices for certain amounts, who otherwise would assume, okay, this order book looks thick enough to where it can absorb my buy order. And in all reality, uh, they're essentially caught in this trap where they're pushing the market upward in an unexpected way, unable to pull out due to lack of liquidity. So this is something we've talked about at no end. It is so important. Fake volume on exchanges giving crypto a bad name. Back from the 9th of August, 2018. This has been at the forefront for so long now. And again, this article references crypto exchange ranks. Another group that we've talked about previously. This guy is, yep, this guy is the CEO of Hacken and CER Hacken. CER is a subsidiary of Hacken. And here we are at their crypto exchange ranks um, live kind of database, almost coin market cap S. You can see not a single exchange is currently certified now these guys are doing some great work trying to create certifications for exchanges that they can utilize to prove to their users that they are legitimate their volume is verified here are the hot wallets and cold wallets we change them regularly you can see the balances moving around there it's a level of transparency that one would assumingly expect from a uh, verifiable, auditable digital ledger. However, it doesn't, doesn't seem to be the case yet. Again, individuals are literally putting their money onto an exchange that is currently being hacked, not once but twice, in which the hacker still has de facto control over the wallets. So it just goes to show that this kind of thing isn't necessarily taken as seriously as it perhaps should be. I'm keeping an eye on CER personally, not financial advice or anything, just due to the fact that they're trying to do something about this, uh, something that may actually work, something serious that serves as a barometer as to whether or not these exchanges are indeed legitimate. Previously, we've seen institutions like Bitforex purporting volume of hundreds of millions of dollars and not being able to back any of that up. So strange stuff all around. And really, this is kind of where I guess we can end the episode. I know it was kind of a bit more somber than usual. We don't have huge amounts of news celebrating the fact that institutional money is coming. And indeed, it it is, but nonetheless, this kind of information could potentially dissuade institutions from making more excitable moves and rather approach with an air of caution. And again, that can only prolong the bear market.
Personally, I think that's a great thing. After all, Bitmain was able to rise to the meteoric uh, position of a mining giant throughout the 20, late 2013, throughout 2015 crypto winter, where all other mining equipment uh, groups begin to slowly but surely shut down operation, operations thereby allowing Bitmain to absorb their mining equipment. Could we as well see in the crypto space a consolidation of exchanges by which we see more legitimate liquidity figures, uh, more legitimate practices and security being taken more seriously? I certainly hope so, and as I said, I think it's a good thing for the ecosystem. But let me know what you think below down in the comments, or head on over to the, 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 to the Discord. Head on over to the Discord, where we always have all kinds of fantastic conversations. We're always talking about uh, this kind of stuff. And Origami Oracle gave him a shout out last time. Is always doing some fantastic technical analysis. If you're interested more in the price action that we can potentially see in the next short while, or even over the long term, so. With that said, guys, thanks so much for watching. It has been a pleasure. I always love sharing this information with you all. My name is Paul, signing off for the time being. We are Cryptide, and remember, the tide is rising, as is, hopefully, the transparency in the crypto space.